Hello and welcome to the latest Urban Manifesto. I'm Lucy Bullivant, the founder of Urbanista.org, my webzine for livable urbanism, and together with my colleague Prathima Manoha, the founder of the Urban Vision Think Do Tank, we've created Urban Manifesto, which is a third international platform. And we were prompted to do this because the pandemic and the demands of the demands of transitioning into a new era have brought up profound questions profound questions about the identities, the policies and the processes of urban design and planning. Through Urban Manifesto, which is live streamed every Tuesday, we're bringing together personal manifestos for happier, healthier, more livable, and that means more equitable urban futures from our expert guests from across different disciplines and, and backgrounds. So Prathama is going to introduce today's theme and our two splendid guests in just a minute. The way that it works is we invite each guest to present their three minute manifesto, three priorities of action. Then we explore the issues in a Q and A with them, after which we invite you, our audience, to ask our guests questions. So in helping to meet the challenges brought about by the pandemic, Urban Manifesto offers opportunities to learn about holistic strategies and to, moreover, to unlearn, if possible, old ways that have lost their relevance or which are downright unhelpful in the 21st century, at least to, uh, to sit and uh, have insight into alternative perspectives. This would be really, really beneficial for all of us, I think, that we reflect, and we are indeed reflecting very, very deeply so please support our roadmap for progressive, resilient and responsible urban change. And as always, a shout out to our partner, the Architecture Foundation, for live streaming each episode as part of its ongoing 100 Days Studio program. Thank you very much to the Foundation. So over to you, Prathima. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy, and welcome to the Urban Manifesto. Um, today's theme is the future of infrastructure. Uh, we all recognize that infrastructure is, the, is really the foundation of any nation and almost the backbone to a more uh, efficient and better functioning community. Um, and we believe that the road to economic and social recovery out of this crisis will be largely through infrastructure development. And we hope the vision for that next generation infrastructure, um, you know, should be more about resilience, equity, and sustainability. Uh, and we hope to outline some of those ideas with two amazing uh, thought leaders who are uh, joining us today. Federico Paralato, he's the uh, senior partner at mobility in chain um, and he's been involved in numerous um, large mega urban development projects worldwide with clients ranging from uh, city governments to the technology industry to big transport companies and operators. Mm -hmm. He's also collaborated with Foster's, uh, Foster and Partners on the zero carbon city in Mazdar. And we also have Stefan, Kirkland. He's currently the city chief uh, executive uh, of Paris for Arcadis, uh, which is a global leader in design and consultancy for built and natural assets. Uh, I met him last year, late last year, when we all could travel in Paris to see um, what is called the second biggest infrastructure project in the world today, which is the Grand Paris project. So I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing more about that project. So thank you both for uh, joining us. And uh, before we uh, kind of dig deep into your scene setting manifestos, I want to quickly ask you, how have you been during this last six months of very odd times? Mm. Federico? Oh, I think you are on mute. Federico, you're... Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I mean, I've been, uh, I've been uh, the first uh, few weeks here in Milan, uh, where uh, I don't know if it was 
perceived from from other sides of other parts of Europe or the world. But the truth is that in the first two three weeks it was kind of paranoia. You know, people went really mad, and uh, we felt we were in the middle of some sort of catastrophe, which is uh, in a way something that happened, but not as bad as we expected. Then, to me at least, it's been a uh, you know if I take away that. Uh, uh, weeks and also the tra- tragedy that has been uh, coming with that, uh, to me, has been, uh, I would say, uh, uh, obviously, in a tragedy, a positive moment of uh, stepping back from uh, our frenzy lifestyle and uh, our kind of uh, intense or too intense way of moving and living and doing things. And it was great to have uh, the opportunity to step back and think. And this, I think, was due to two, two elements. One thing, because we had simply more time for ourselves. You know, we were less busy mm-hmm. going around constantly. And the other component that I think was very important is that when the catastrophe or something similar to a catastrophe happened, it's really a possible uh, sort of moment of, of change, you know, kind of a threshold of change and I think the two things combined to me were very interesting and if I have to go back aside from the tragedy I think it's been a a positive a very positive six weeks. You're right I think it gave us a time to reflect. Mm -hmm. Uh, Stefan how have things been in Paris? Yeah things have been uh, very interesting if I answer your question from a very personal point of view uh, but that does have a link to uh, urban issues is that I, um, I live in the center of Paris in a sort of private little street, a muse, where we were allowed to move uh, during the confinement. So one thing that was very interesting is that uh, the, the confinement experience created a new sense of community at this very hyper-local level, just a couple of buildings next to each other. So that was a, a really interesting experience to um, really use the uh, totally otherworldly um, experience of uh, totally empty Paris during that time to kind of reinvent mm-hmm. the forms of, uh, of, um, of, of social connection. Uh, second point is very much like Federico. Uh, I really actually uh, took advantage of it, to, uh, of the period to, uh, to read, to slow down, to meditate more, to do more yoga, to do things like that. And so um, I, I've, I found it personally a very positive period, a bit uh, monastic, uh, but I enjoyed that. And I thought that was a, a good change from our frenzy, frenzied lifestyle. And uh, mm-hmm. the final thing is that it was really, and we'll talk much more about this, uh, interesting to me how um, uh, we were able to test new forms of, uh, of living together and in ways that, uh, that can ha- have some, some uh, perhaps more durable impact on our cities. Great. So, you know, so now we can drive into the urban manifesto where we've asked both of you to outline the vision for future of infrastructure. So I am just pulling up the slides. And Federico, you can go first. I have your slides up. Um, I don't see them. Okay. No, the, the, sorry, it's uh, obviously, you know, uh, a lot of things to be brought into one single, uh, I'm sorry, in just three slides, but uh, I just to try to, I just try to put three concepts which are important to me. The first one is this video that we might start. Mm-hmm. It's basically what you see in white is uh, the Western world uh, car ownership levels. It's kind of uh, goes into steps, but you should be seeing, you know, basically, you know, what you see is that uh, the, 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 the Western world, states included, is a market of replacement for cars. Uh, the truth is that it's, uh, it's my market that has reached its own, or apparently seems like it uh, has reached its own capacity. Uh, whereas uh, 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 what, what is the difference is actually coming from the uh, eastern part of the world, from China and from India. This is actually uh, China is the car sales that takes us to 2018. And uh, uh, basically, uh, the truth is that uh, uh, the car market is actually in that part of the world exploding. Wow. And uh, very often, we tend to say that uh, uh, there is an issue of uh, exploding population. But the truth is that uh, there is a study from the, uh, the World Bank that says that, that by 2030, there will be Two, two billion vehicles on, on, on the streets, two billions, meaning 
At the moment, we have 800 million. So, and that's the quote from Schlaffer b below, you know, the biggest wave of motorization is yet to come. So if we think that we are living the world of car and the, the age of car, the truth is that uh, this is not uh, actually happening. You know, if we keep on going that way and we have the raise, if we raise the kind of uh, uh, car ownership to the level of Europe and by the level of Europe, I can also say, uh, you know, Denmark or the Netherlands, we are going we are going to go towards an explosive growth. And the other thing is that the growth, and this is my first uh, component, will always will all happen in metropolitan external peripheral areas. I think, and Paris in this way, in a way, is, uh, at least from our point of view, is one of the, the cities that the lead is leading the way. I'm, I'm a true believer that cities will become uh, uh, car-free uh, in the range of uh, 10, 15 years. Maybe car-free as such is not right. You know, there will be a very limited amount of traffic uh, going through it, and uh, the space will be redistributed for other, uh, for other functions, which are much more valuable for cities. So we, I believe that the game for reducing car ownership is going to be actually happening outside the, the internal part of cities, which are already basically in a process of uh, removing uh, cars uh, from, from the roads. And my third is, uh, final slide is obviously trying to recap maybe too many things altogether. Uh, I'm a great believer of the fact that, uh, especially in uh, mature uh, countries in terms of economy, uh, there is no real need for uh, new large infrastructure. Uh, I don't know if you can go to the last slide. There's no real need for last, uh, new large uh, transport infrastructure. Uh, I do believe that we should move away from uh, high speed uh, 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 and fixed uh, 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 networks. I, I don't think we need uh, to go towards uh, uh, an increment of rail connections and high speed connections, but we should start thinking about the possibility to start working on isotropic networks, meaning uh, networks that do not have a strong hierarchy, onto which uh, you know uh, non-motorized uh, uh, non-motorized uh, vehicles or uh, uh, non-motorized uh, modes will actually happen, pedestrian walking, uh, but also uh, public transport, uh, surface public transport. I think that is the way forward. It's very difficult to imagine what the future is. Maybe go, you can go back to that when uh, maybe have a chat about master. But the truth is that it's very difficult to assess what the future is. But one thing is for certain: there is no link anymore in uh, European countries between uh, growth in uh, movement of cars and people and the economy uh, uh, growing. These two things have been decoupled. This is a fact, and uh, uh, we have to start thinking about infrastructure or something that allows to move people and things in a sustainable, decarbonized uh, way. And I think that has to happen with a reduced speed, with a much more connected uh, uh, sort of set of networks that allows to cover areas without accelerating. That's it, more or less. Thank you, Federico. I think uh, you outlined the biggest challenge that we face in this century, which is moving away from those car-centric cities to uh, lower carbon, walkable, rich places. So thank you for that. Um, I am going to just bring up uh, Fed, uh, Stefan's slides. Uh, Stefan, tell us about your ideas for the future of uh, infrastructure. I think we have your slides up now. Oh, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so I've got uh, my three three points of my urban manifesto here. The first is that um, for me the so there was a real tendency that I found interesting during all of this to um, examine the potential uh, implications of what we were going through with the pandemic with a very very narrow lens and basically that everything that was happening to us in a given week or set of weeks to expand that and say okay well. Um, is the pandemic the issue and what happens if we stay confined forever and maybe we will want to ever uh, start taking our cars and interacting again and everything. And that really our role is to step back and take a broader view. And for me, the big broader view is that the lesson of COVID-19 is far more, much more far reaching 
than we think, and it's about resilience in the broadest sense. Um, what really strikes me when I, I teach at uh, the School of Political Science in Paris, uh, Sciences Po, and I have a, a class that I've done for, for six years, that uh, where I go through all the um, existential threats to cities, and pandemic was just one of a long and, and, and starkly depressing list. And I think all of these are, are threats, that, so whether it's um, uh, cyber uh, terrorism or, or just uh, uh, the technology falling down, whether it's drought, whether it's uh, flooding, whether it's storms, whether it's terrorism, and pandemics, those are all things that we're going to continue to be um, subject to. And it's not a new, it's an ongoing thing that um, probably it will intensify with, uh, with what we've put our planet through. And, that, uh, and resilience in that broad sense is really the key to our urban future. We can talk about that more in detail later, but that's, that's the first point. Mm. Second point is uh, that um, about the relevance of local autonomy. So um, this, this uh, really, I think, uh, came out starkly. And as we have these big shocks that are continuing to come, that are going to continue to come on our cities, uh, things like having local access to, uh, to, to medicines, to, to health products, to foods, things like that, uh, growing food and working in, a, in, a, in a, the, the importance of having local supply um, and also working and socializing in uh, in small communities. All of this really increased in importance. And we realized that perhaps these this, these global networks aren't going to be for there for us all the time, and and therefore the incre uh, importance of the local increased. And the third point is really the direct implication of all of this on infrastructure, uh, which is that um, I, I agree that in in Western countries like. Uh, uh, France being one of them, we probably uh, have about as much uh, infrastructure as we need. And the big issue is that our cities need to continue to function in all sorts of radically different scenarios. And we're, the issue for us in, in, in countries that have already built out a lot of infrastructure is that we're going to be, need to be very creative and ready to readapt our urban infrastructure. So I have you know, an example there of a articulated uh, tram that runs, uh, doesn't run on, on rails and that can use existing infrastructure in the city. Um, and part of that is things that we're working on in Paris, such as using uh, highways either for uh, cycling or else for mass transit, on a, so using lanes of highways that are dedicated to that sort of thing. I also put a picture of the uh, bike lanes that were put up on an emergency basis in order to um, to allow people to bike along that, uh, mass transit routes during <laughs> confinement. And then uh, there's issues about how you adapt infrastructure in cases of flooding uh, on the left or drought on the right. So all of these out there to elaborate on together in our discussion if we are interested in doing that. These are slides for later, so I won't comment these now. I wasn't thinking of commenting these now. Uh, talk more about Campari Express. Maybe it's sure. But I think point taken, Stefan, I think resiliency is probably the biggest component of future success of nations and cities. Um, and I, I think we've all heard a ton about the 20 minute city uh, that uh, Paris has kind of revealed. I think it's come, uh, um, you know, come out a lot during our conversations. And uh, you're right, like I think enabling the local economy and local services is so important for resilience and livability. Lucy? Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciated your both your, your respective manifestos very much. Um, I think Federico, it's very, uh, and also uh, Stefan, because you, you referred to the importance of the local uh, in, inter, independence or uh, sustainability at the local level. I think we need inclusive growth in Europe. If we are, you know, I interviewed the city architect of Copenhagen the other day and they're piloting a, a car-free city centre at the moment. Yeah, so it's inclusive growth. So it seems very clear that the adaptability and the, the resilience of our uh, infrastructure strategies has to be geared towards unlocking other social good goods or social 
benefit, social value. Um, and uh, also, obviously, as part of that, resilience from the macro to the micro is needed, as, as Stefan said very correctly, in the very broadest sense, to cope with the, the, the myriad of existential threats. Um, there's a new book by the urban um, urbanist uh, Joe Ravetz, who is a key um, teacher at the Laboratory of Sustainability and Resilience at University of Manchester. It's called Deeper City. And one of his key points to, to do with resilience is the very sheer need for collective intelligence to solve these problems. So I think the question coming out of my my off the top of my head reflections on your on your manifestos is, uh, you, you know, how are we going to design differently? Um, Fred, Fred, Federico, it's isotropic infrastructure. Uh, Stefan uh, observing the ways in which systems and structures are procured and delivered. What kinds of changes do we have to uh, to be much more um, skilled at uh, navigating? Feder Federico first. Um, um, maybe you could explain. Uh, you could explain perhaps what you mean by isotropic as well, because that's yeah. a nice term to, to explore a bit. Yeah, isotropic means that uh, it, uh, it's based on, uh, on a research done by uh, a guy I never met, but uh, I read his work and I really like it. It's mm -hmm. called Bernardo Secchi. He's passed away 10 years ago. And uh, he, he basically, uh, he was an urban planner, uh, incredibly innovative and uh, in his studies, he was referring back to uh, the fact that uh, uh, we have to go towards an isotropic network. By isotropic, it means that it retains all the geometrical properties in all the directions. And I think that the cities in general, uh, you know, even if you start it from a boulevard system, uh, Paris uh, kind of style, mm -hmm. or in a way from a village network, uh, kind of London sort of style, mm -hmm. uh, in a way London is already in that direction. Uh, mm -hmm because of his morphology, is that, uh, you know, the, the road network will have to become uh, uh, basically a fine uh, road network of one by one lanes, maybe two by two to, uh, to uh, uh, allow public transport. And uh, all, the other, all the rest of the space will be redistributed for other, for other purposes. In, mm. in a way, uh, the isotropic network with a fine grid also have the flexibility to have a segment of the grid to be used uh, throughout the day for other opportunities for other functions so it means that uh, if you add if you have a network a fine network of isotropic so without a strong uh, road hierarchy you can start imagining a city that works on a permanent all slow speed system into mm -hmm. which in my opinion there would be very little if any space for surface parking and uh, uh, cities will be working that that way and i think that that is already happening in a way, you know, it's a process that is set in motion, is, is actually uh, happening, and uh, uh, then it can be, you know, pushed to different limits. I'm not, a, I'm not so, so fond, fond of, of, of uh, carless uh, cities as such, because the risk is that, in a way, you know, a city needs to be accessed, needs to be serviced, needs to have uh, things happening. So... And I saw, for instance, in some Italian cities, if you expand like Florence, the, the fully pedestrian areas, you tend to somehow uh, uh, crystallize the urban framework. So there is a sort of backward effect of transforming something into uh, what is not a city anymore, if you want. So we have to retain uh, the possibility of accessing a city, but you have to do it in a sustainable, sensible, and uh, balanced uh, space-wise uh, mm -hmm. way. So in that sense, I think uh, isotropic network. And I think that in a way, what's happening is in Paris with the progressive redistribution of the space is actually uh, what's going to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, what's going to happen uh, in uh, all the cities around the world, uh, basically. Uh, I could ask something which I, I always I was talking to Tim Stoner about it recently, you know, because the truth is that the hierarchy, hierarchical system of roads uh, is, yeah, basically based, based in, yeah, is basically based on a work mm -hmm. done by Colin Buchanan, you know, at least in Europe, in traffic in town, it was sort of, uh, there's this famous drawing uh, 
uh, of uh, these uh, sort of multi-level junctions of Tottenham Court Road uh, uh, crossing uh, Oxford, uh, Oxford Street in a sort of crazy flyover system. It's actually funny that, uh, you know, this kind of way of thinking uh, and this strong hierar hierarchical system has created so many problems in so many cities, mm. but not in London, because uh, Colin Buchanan was based in London, but the community in London was so strong and so wealthy to prevent that vision to happen because, you know, the community prevented that to happen. So I think that that kind of vision applied for several other cities. It doesn't come from Paris, obviously, because it comes from Osman. But what, I, what, what, I'm trying, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, I, I think that, you know, there was this push toward a hierarchical system. is now time to the 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 Iraqi eyes, if I can say, the road network can turn into a network of similar uh, uh, hierarchy uh, of, of roads, we, therefore isotropic, you know, without a hierarchy. Let's yeah, I mean, um, so Stefan, I mean, Paris has seen a huge number of very very progressive initiatives to support resilience. Um, and your politicians seem to be to be speaking the, the language of resilience very effortlessly. Um, it, if you remember the main thrust of my question, uh, perhaps you could make some comment about how the adaptations yeah. need to manifest themselves, maybe within a very particular time frame. We'll we'll go on to talk about Le Grand Paris in in a short while, but. Uh, I'm talking about yeah. quality of space, quality of public space, really. Yeah, uh, I think the, the the first thing I wanted to get back on in your question, Lucy, was um, mm. about um, uh, equity and inclusion. Um, yeah. And the the remark I wanted to make about that is that you know it was very striking how the experience of confinement was an amplifier of social differences. You asked us how we experienced it in the beginning, uh, Fatima. Mm. And, uh, I think we, we had a you know, typical um, experience of, of, of the people, um, the type of people that we represent, but that it was that experience was extremely varied uh, in different groups of people. We, we, um, we, we did not experience the difficulties that, um, that large numbers of people experienced. Um, and so we, we got a lot of uh, stories and feedback about uh, the, 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 the actual very human and social problems that experienced with uh, increases in child abuse and domestic abuse and real cases of uh, mental health issues and strife uh, during the uh, deconfinement. Um, and that those were not equitably uh, distributed geographically. And so for me, it's like really that, um, that the experience of confinement was a, uh, a kind of almost a, a test, a way to, to make, uh, make the um, uh, latent uh, social differences and, and uh, uh, really come out. And one of, the, one of the areas that I think we really need to not take for granted in that is the simple uh, aspect of um, access to uh, medicine and to food in cases when mm. the supply chain is severely disrupted. And uh, again, mm. there are places where they experienced uh, difficulty uh, in, in having access to, to medicine, to food, to, to absolute basics uh, during mm. that period. So I think uh, when you talk about equity and inclusion, um, I, 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 I would uh, really emphasize that as something that should be a learning from what, what we've experienced and how we need to focus on, uh, on ways to, um, to, to uh, reduce the inequity and, um, and to help uh, give conditions of urban life that can, can uh, that goes together mm. with resilience. It's a form of social resilience that when mm. when cities meet these shocks, that the population as a whole can withstand them, not just those that have privileged conditions to uh, experience them all. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Social infrastructure is remains as absolutely critical as ever social infrastructure in all its manifestations for sure and i mean obviously you know uh, uh, those of us living in large cities with metro and underground systems have seen uh, you know vast majority of the population turning away from our uh, uh, this kind of public infrastructure uh, just not not using it 
Um, that begs the question of whether it's sustainable in the future or whether there will be literally a permanent shift to bicycles and uh, um, and uh, more walking and so on. But we'll, we'll come back to these kind of issues. Everything is interwoven in our program. <laughs> so um, we'll come back to these issues. So Pratima, you have the next question. Yeah, I, Thank I, you. I, I want to push um, a little bit on the question of um, urban infrastructure for a great city. Mm. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what kinds of uh, infrastructure is needed for a livable city and how do we use this to trigger more equitable and sustainable development? And I know you also have worked in the uh, developing world. So give us the contrast between um, some of these issues from a emerging uh, versus developed world perspective. Yeah, there, there, there are two things I wanted to say. The first one is that uh, um, I do believe that uh, uh, we have to change uh, a few things uh, uh, in the way we uh, think about infrastructure and mobility, because uh, uh, I think uh, it's very difficult to predict the future. It's very difficult to know what's going to happen and to make decisions now on something that is very uncertain. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the future now is very difficult to predict. Uh, and, uh, like, you know, when we worked on Mazdar, it was the 2003, to give you a sense of that, there was at the time no uh, iPhone, so no peer-to-peer -peer communication. Uh, the iPhone was, uh, the smart work, uh, smartphone were not there. So nobody knew that they were coming. Uh, and nobody knew that, uh, you know, sharing, and the communication through GPS could have happened. And there was no discussion whatsoever on driverless cars, on mass-produced driverless cars. There was no mm -hmm. technology, no nothing. So basically, uh, imagining the future is now more difficult than ever, than ever. But there is one thing that we have to stick to, which is uh, something that is the most, uh, as Bruno Latour says, critical and difficult to, 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 to contrast uh, from uh, 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 an epistemological point of view, which is the fact that we are going through a climate emergency. And I think that is uh, uh, the, the issue, you know, the, 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 the fact that we have to be inclusive uh, in terms of uh, uh, society, but also we have to go through a process of decarbonization. That's simply, you know, something that we have to do. So what are the paths ahead for that? And what are the paths ahead that allows us to think, uh, to think, uh, uh, to think uh, an inclusive uh, solutions and the process of decarbonizations? I think there are three components. Uh, one is, uh, and I go back to the final part of your question in a minute. One thing is that, uh, as also Stefan was saying, is the the land use patterns and the fact that we have to increase uh, uh, proximity. Although there is an issue. Uh, of uh, low density areas where uh, availability of option becomes thinner and where uh, uh, density of land use becomes weaker and that's where the car battle I think will be fought and not in the city center of Paris or London or mm. Milan but in those uh, suburban outskirts. The second part and I, I'm a true believer, I know it, sounds, it might sound a little weird, but I'm a true believer on no, no motorized trips, bikes and pedestrians, but I'm a true believer that those trips will have to be expanded. You know, every now and then when we do presentations on, on uh, urban planning uh, uh, transportation, there is always the, uh, the Taliban of cycling that comes in and screams to me, why did you do that? Why that? No. <laughs> and, uh, and the truth is that uh, I do believe, and I always try to talk to those guys, that in the future, uh, 10, maybe 15 years from now, a trip of 10, 12, 14 kilometers, if we provide the infrastructure, could happen on bike. A walking distance of two, three kilometers could happen on walking distance. And I think that is a paramount importance because it is also about of health, uh, uh, lifestyle, health quality, uh, lifestyle uh, uh, in general, you know, as, as a population, we are getting older, but we work, we have about, say, compared to 100 years ago, we have about 700,000 hours of lifetime. Uh, our uh, amount of uh, hours of lifetime was uh, 400,000 
100 years ago, but our mm -hmm. time to work is compressed. We even sleep less. So we have time to be awake. We have more time. We have to shift some of those times for uh, lifestyles, inclusive, but also health. And I think the non-motorized trips, the what I call the long distance walking and, and cycling will be a key component for moving in the future. And the third thing is, uh, uh, maybe we'll talk about that, uh, digital communication and uh, uh, what we're doing now, communicating digitally. But if I compare this to the, we worked a lot in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's actually interesting to see how uh, those cities have already, are already complying with uh, the most important component of all, which is walking and cycling for uh, walking mostly for mm -hmm. long distance. If you go to the slums of Nairobi or, uh, or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, Angola or, 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 uh, or Accra, uh, you know, it's interesting to see how mixed the, the things are happening in the, in the slums. There's so much diversity, so much land use, but it's also interesting to see how much people are willing to walk. So that kind of pattern will have to be, you know, we have to fight Mm. But I think those those structures of city to stay as to stay as it is. They have we have to we have to fight not to go towards our model and mm. keep them on on this long walking distance, which is the habit they are currently in. You're right, Federico. In uh, my city of Mumbai, 55 percent people walk as their primary mode of transit. But um, one of our big infrastructure projects seems to be a coastal road for the cars. And I think that's I the disconnect. <laughs> we yeah. don't build for the majority. And uh, Stefan, I want to press you a little bit about the question of uh, resilience. Even before the pandemic, uh, I, I think it was the Global Facility for Disaster Risk Reduction, which had estimated that extreme weather events uh, related to climate change uh, in the last decade or two had impacted more than 4 billion people. That's 90%, you know, 90% of our large part of our world and had cost almost $1.9 trillion uh, in economic loss across various sectors. And uh, I think it's, like you mentioned, it's become very, very crucial to future-proof our infrastructure for such events uh, and to respond to a very fast-moving world. So tell us a little bit about what does resilient infrastructure look like? What, what are the different components uh, that make for a resilient urban infrastructure? Yeah. So um, it, f first thing I, I'd like to say is, as a, so I, I work for uh, Arcadis, is a global engineering and uh, consulting company uh, working on, as you said, the, the built and natural environment. And resilience is a huge part of, uh, of what we do. And it's a big part of our DNA, being a, a Dutch company that was founded as an engineering company in the uh, 19th century, working on a country that was fundamentally uh, below sea level and where uh, resilience was a, uh, was a concern. So that's something at the heart uh, from the beginning of this company. And what uh, is very striking to us is that uh, up to now, you can follow the pattern of investment in, in, in resilience uh, as a lagging indicator of, uh, of extreme events. And so basically, whenever there's a Hurricane Sandy or Katrina or a, or a pandemic or something, Afterwards, you get kind of a, a, a curve of, of concern and investment, and then that kind of peters away until the next major investment, so the next major event. Um, and we, we uh, have no end of trying to get people to have a lasting and systemic uh, approach to uh, resilience. And that's the most difficult because really it follows the news cycle and that is not the way to approach a resilient city. So this gets to the answer to your second part of the question is what does it look like? Well, it looks like a place where thinking about risks and taking preventative measures to risks is a way of life. It is not a, a something that you take, do a big wave of after you've been freaked out by something. And that's unfortunately the, uh, the, the modus operandi of, uh, of most of the world uh, until now. So I think it's a real culture 
of preparedness and prevention, I think, is the first thing that we need to uh, say about that. And maybe to give a little more concrete uh, answer to that, I, I would say two things. One is that um, it has to do with uh, understanding risks and taking simple measures in order to mitigate the impact of them. So, for example, we've done a, 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 a project for the Dutch Railway where it was a simple, simple assessment of things because in typical infrastructure decisions, uh, there are kind of rules and algorithms and, and, and patterns that, uh, that engineers and designers and all the people involved in doing them put in place that don't take uh, extreme account events into account uh, that often. Okay, so there's, there's the exception, for example, at highway, highways, they, they look at terrorist or, um, or, uh, or fire events. But um, that, for, so for example, with example with the railway company, it was simply um, the positioning of the signaling equipment and the electrical uh, systems that you could displace them by 30 centimeters in some cases and have a complete, a, a wildly different outcome in the case of a flood, for example. So what this is a concrete illustration of what I'm saying about a culture of preparedness, understand mm -hmm. this, and then taking what are in the end often very small measures that mean that you are mitigating the impact of the risk when it occurs and you are, mm -hmm. especially the true sense of resilience is you are facilitating recovery after the inevitable event is going to, to happen. Um, mm. That was my first point. And then the second point of the answer is what I was talking uh, to about earlier, which is uh, simply um, a, a, uh, 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 what I think is really going to happen in the end. And you see inside of this cli-fi fiction and that sort of thing, which is being extremely creative about how we readapt and reuse uh, what we have. And that, that's a, actually a thing where the developing world, the uh, developed world can learn from the developing world. And so we have all these fancy pieces of infrastructure kit that we've designed in a very precise way with a set of specifications in order to perform in a certain way in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in various use cases. And then in real life, so these are long, long lasting assets that can live 40, 60, 80 years, and in real life, the specific use cases and the specifications that we've painstakingly designed our uh, infrastructure to get thrown out the window because we have uh, cases that we didn't anticipate. And there we need to ask ourselves, well, how do we go from scratch and just be extremely creative and figure out how an infrastructure can be reused? And I'll give one example about that that makes a link back to Paris, which is that um, we have a very extensive urban highway network, network in Paris. And last year, uh, driven by the city of Paris with a number of other entities, cities around it in the Paris region, uh, we, there was a, a major project to um, reconsider how in, to the, at the, on the horizon of 2030 and 2040 and 2050, we are going to creatively rethink the use of this infrastructure in scenarios that were not at all anticipated at the, in, the, in the design of these infrastructures. So rather than looking at them as things that are to um, perform a particular function, to say, actually, they're just artifacts. And how can we be creative about using those in an environment that's completely different from the ones that they were designed? And I think mm -hmm. that's the kind of thinking we're going to need to push uh, more and more, and that truly will make us resilient where we look at the, uh, the cities and this infrastructure that we have that surround us that we've built up and look at them as actually just assets that we can reuse in, in perhaps uh, unexpected ways. And uh, maybe if I can add something, uh, just on top of what uh, Stefan just said, which I think uh, was very interesting, uh, you know, and also coming back to uh, the comments earlier on about uh, uh, less developed part of, of, of emerging economies. You know, I remember when I was working uh, in Nairobi uh, a long time ago, about uh, now nine years ago, they were building a road called Fika Road. It was basically a, a massive uh, highway, uh, basically cutting the, 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 the tissue of the city and uh, basically driving cars towards the very heart of the, of the city. And it was actually interesting. As I was there, as a transport consultant for a real estate development to see how the road was actually designed in a way that was preventing any connectivity pedestrian-wise. 
people there walks a lot and the way the roadway was designed was completely ignoring the soft mobility and the non-motorized trips. They were basically severing the city in two parts forever. And uh, in a way, we also know now the infrastructure drive, drive use is not a predict and provide. We know that things loop, uh, feedbacks, loops, uh, the way even uh, uh, relatively complex uh, things like mobility works is mm. often unpredictable, is often made of, of uh, loops and, and feedback systems. And clearly by creating an infrastructure like that, you were actually landing on a city of walking people, a piece of infrastructure that was totally dedicated to the car, preventing any other use. And it's actually interesting now to go back to what Stefan said, to see that the city, among other things which are uh, far away from being a good idea, is actually using thicker road to uh, uh, put a, a, a BBRT system, and is a, a, a big bus network on dedicated lanes, taking two lanes away of this, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, three plus three lanes, and uh, connecting the BRT with bridges, allowing pedestrians to cross. Mm. So again, back to Stefan, it's actually an interesting case of, you know, having an infrastructure that was coming out of a completely car-dominated culture, severing a piece of city, understanding the mistake, overlapping the public transport network, and by doing so, reconnecting the two parts of the city for, for non-motorized trips and soft mobility. And I think that, as Stefan was saying, we need more and more of that, you know. That's it. So perhaps um, there's one subject maybe we could get to if you, you're interested in looking at the Grand Paris Express and uh, how in, in a way you could think of that as um, preparing a more isotropic city uh, to go back to Federico's uh, uh, intervention. Yeah. Sh sh shall we spend a second on that? Sure, I have your sure. slides up as well. Great, let's move to the next one directly. It'll go a little faster. and. Go to the next slide. The next. Here we go. Yes, this one here. So um, this one, I think it'll come into focus in a second. I hope is um, so. This is uh, the density map of Paris, and this really goes to um, the the uh, uh, isotropicity, right? Have I invented a new word, Federico, uh, of the city? <laughs> Um, where what you see here is the, uh, the, the ring of the peripheric highway and that everything within that, the 100 square kilometers of Paris is uh, very dense, 21,000 people per uh, inhabitants, residents per square meter, mm -hmm. uh, per square kilometer, sorry. And, um, and, and this, for, this is a, uh, what I call, to, call uh, to my students, uh, basically the densest urban form you can uh, create without the elevator. So at Hausmann's time uh, in the Second Empire, it was uh, seven, eight-story buildings that are quite tightly packed and uh, and form this type of urban fabric. And what you can see is immediately after the periphery, this drops down dramatically. You have totally, in most places, totally different forms of urban um, settlement and a uh, massive decrease in that, uh, in that density. And that what we could summarize the Grand Paris Express as being, so it's a 35 billion euro uh, super fast uh, highway, automated highway system, is um, basically creating the type of, uh, of public transportation connections in that less dense ring around the center that exists, the same type that exists in the center. So if you go to the next slide, right now, you will see the... Um, there we go. This is the Grand Paris Express network, and where you see the uh, gray area in the middle is the is the city center of Paris that we saw in red, and that the uh, so the blue is the the new uh, metro um, system that is uh, is being uh, built currently, um, and that basically is going to connect. You see all the the, the gray circles with uh, arrows next to them. Those are the ends of the existing metro lines and that are going to basically be tied together. And the whole idea is to create um, uh, development hubs around all of these uh, centers to increase the density around the center 
and uh, and all the same all the while to create a, um, a different type, a more uh, 21st century uh, type of urban form compared to the uh, 19th century that we have in Paris. You can go uh, back to the first slide to just conclude. Well, the the one two before the one that I skipped over a second ago. This one, and that uh, therefore the the vision of the Grand Paris uh, of Greater Paris was to combine three aspects with the transportation, which is here on the right, that is this new uh, big investment in a transportation network, and then urban projects that use the urban transportation uh, network as hubs to develop from and to create this new type of uh, urban form that is more, uh, more resilient, more, um, more sustainable, and more um, inclusive. And then all of that tied together with a governance system that also um, allows you know, the proper level of representativity within this uh, urban urban unit that we're we're kind of recreating. And so it's interesting how this thinking cuts across the discussions that we had here because uh, it is about creating a big piece of infrastructure. So mm -hmm. in the context of what we've just been saying, you know, what we would say, well, is that really what we should be doing? Should we be investing 35 billion euros? in a big piece of infrastructure in a city that already has a lot of infrastructure. Um, and it's also not um, a uh, soft mobility, form of soft mobility. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and just give it my view right now, which is that um, I, I feel that we need a form of, and we'll see if Federico agrees or if, he, or if we'll, we'll have a good uh, discussion on this. Um, I, I do feel that for a city the scale of Paris, the 12 and a half million uh, inhabitants at the, at the scale of the urban unit. Um, it is good to have some uh, major, like a backbone of, uh, of mass transportation connections and that perhaps in, the, in, in some forms of urban shocks, having a uh, strong um, back, backbone uh, that allows you to move across the urban region quite quickly uh, can be an asset. But I think that what we need to do is to have that in complementarity with the finer grain of, uh, of mobility that will take place uh, uh, on the surface um, and, and kind of form uh, uh, another network. And so I think the, the big mistake to make would be to continue to try to build that out. But then we, what we need to do instead is seek out the complementarity with uh, whether it's uh, very light uh, public uh, like bus networks on the surface or else, of course, um, bicycles and walking uh, in the surface that become, become complementary complementary with that. Stefan, I remember uh, coming to meet you uh, at one of the in one of the nodes in Saint Denis, yeah. I think, uh, in I mean, your side office uh, late last year, and I had a big map of just like the project management office, like there was just like a big grid, and I was I, I think this project was so uh, interesting because you know at the end of the day it was. It was just a ring metro system, but they enlarged the uh, program and vision by enabling new urban centers and new urban infrastructure that got created. And I think uh, that's the big trigger that infrastructure can play. And mm. I, I think Grand Perry really demonstrate that, demonstrates that. And I, I, I think the president who was responsible for this was Nicholas Sarkozy, correct? Correct. Yes. And he, I, I, I remember uh, um, speaking to some, uh, pu you know, public policy folks in Paris who said that he thought about this project almost as a big economic development uh, stimulant, not just for Paris but for France. Uh, right. You know, for a right. Yes. And and the 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 fascinating thing is that. In, in Napoleon III in, uh, in the 1850s, saw the building of the Paris we have now exactly in the same way. In fact, it was almost like a um, public works administration type project uh, mm. in order to um, actually start by, so Napoleon III write a, wrote a book uh, about um, uh, combating pauperism at the time. And um, and uh, and so part of the project was really an economic stimulus uh, project, and it just um, happened to have fortunate byproducts in urban terms. And let's hope the same the same is true this time around. Yeah. 
I mean, it represents absolutely mammoth unlocking. It will really, as I think quite a lot of commentators have made that point, it will change, the, there will be changing consciousness about the identity of Paris. I mean, is it um, technically, uh, you know, currently because of the peripherique built in the 1950s, is it 2.2 million um, inhabitants in, living in places like Saint-Denis and, and some of the other areas? Um, are divided from the 10 million, but uh, once Le Grand Paris is, is delivered, it's the other no piece. Longer... There's 2.3 million yeah. living inside the peripheric and the 10 million living outside. Oh, yes, wow. what I mean. Yes, exactly. I mean, I mean that the, the sub suburbs uh, yes. hold by far the m majority of, of exactly. Paris. Exactly. And right, people yeah. have speculated, you know, that. They already see Paris as multicultural, but that they say that this will um, enforce, uh, reinforce people's perception of the reality of well, the, the incredible diversity of Paris's cultural. Maybe to back things. to the inclusion point, and uh, you were talking about it at the beginning, and have to do yeah. with the cultural aspect of, of Grand Paris, and that's a, yeah. an aspect that um, a number of people have been working on because the identity of Paris is really just this center that represents uh, about 15% of the population of actual Paris. It does mean, yeah. More of a multicultural, diverse, and vibrant and dynamic place than you get credit for when you look mm -hmm. just at that part of it. And so that's been that's one of the reasons why we took the group out to Saint-Denis and, and went uh, trooping, uh, trooping around uh, the area and that, mm -hmm. um, there are now, for example, uh, guides to uh, Grand Paris. There's a lot of uh, things about the cultural things to do beyond the peripherique, and hopeful. And this this uh, new new uh, transportation network will hopefully really go one step further in creating those connections, together with the other big thing that we're working on in a lot of places, which is to create actual physical connections, which uh, go over the or under the peripherique that connect. The Paris and the and the neighboring areas that have been so uh, cut off mm. since the 1950s and 1960s when they uh, when they mm. when they when they opened um, mm. so um, that 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 is it, it opens a whole new realm of possibilities that we only got because we were so fragmented because of this history uh, which also which has both a physical and then a political aspect to it too um, mm. separating Paris from the rest. Yeah, I mean, the question I had for Federico was um, talking about a statement he made some time ago uh, in earlier on in the last decade about how infrastructure projects need to embrace, uh, fully embrace multifaceted complexity, typical of all urban projects. So, you know, pay attention to like mobility, public transport, which we've kind of we've gone into. Um, I mean, Federico, thinking of your home city, Milan, um, which is you're on the, the, the panel of the sustainable transport um, body, aren't you? Um, I mean, what, what, what thoughts when you look at the, uh, the progress of Le Grand Paris, what thoughts about Milan come to your mind about so, certain uh, ways and processes of, uh, of building something quite uh, generative and transforming in its way. Well, obviously the scale of, uh, of Paris and the scale, yeah. Yeah, the scale of Paris and the scale of Grand, uh, and the scale of Milan have nothing mm -hmm. to, to do in the sense that uh, Milan is 1.5 million people and yeah. uh, uh, it's a completely different scale. You know, our uh, cities benchmark are more like a city of oh, a scale of but culturally, mm -hmm. extremely uh, significant, though. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, the, I'm thinking about the, the the scale of the infrastructure is obviously of a different of a different scale. What I can mm -hmm. say has been happening for 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 Milan is that uh, Milan, uh, in terms of the city itself, has a mode share or used to have a mode share on uh, on transport, public transport, which was pretty mm -hmm. good. It was aligned with the, with the best case uh, in. Uh, uh, in Europe, but uh, the problem with Milan was the internal external trips, uh, meaning people that are living in a, a northern part of mostly, which has a, a very specific uh, uh, scattered uh, urban planning uh, network, uh, urban planning, urban uh, uh, fabric, meaning that uh, is a very dispersed uh, sprawl, uh, mm. northern Italy style, and uh, that 
uh, this pass pro uh, is what is actually causing uh, the problem for Milan because there's a vast number of people that enter the city by car. So the truth is that the current situation of, of Milan, which is in a way differs from uh, from uh, Paris, but uh, you you cannot really compare it as such, is that uh, mm. the city has. Uh, 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 really uh, not inscribed any large uh, infrastructure project anymore. All mm. the new roads have stopped. Uh, and uh, uh, there were uh, roads uh, like uh, uh, expansion of ring roads, new uh, urban uh, uh, shortcuts that were supposed to be built. And in the last uh, uh, planning framework, those have been scraped. So there won't be any new road unless it supports the surface public transport. And also we went through a scrutiny of a cost-benefit analysis and the truth was that there is not at the moment a, a direction that allows us to think about having a new metro line. We have five metro lines now, but then if you do a cost-benefit analysis for Milan, it's way better to improve uh, and uh, uh, make uh, much more efficient the surface transport network, meaning with that similar money and way less impact in terms of CO2 emissions, you actually benefit a way larger part of the population, but that's because of the structure of mm. the structure of the city. So at the moment, in a way, Milan is uh, uh, coming along with an idea which is uh, totally opposite from the large infrastructure project, but mm. is also through a process of recombination and redistribution of the surface areas removing space for cars and uh, making a much stronger uh, surface transport network, which is obviously uh, also given the scale of the city. You have to think that the city is about 10 kilometers by 14. So, mm -hmm. you know, in a way, with a proper bike infrastructure, you could go from one end to the other in less than one hour. Mm -hmm. So, basically, uh, that's where the city is going. I think the massive challenge for Milan, but in my opinion, is the massive challenge for a lot of cities around the world, meaning that you know, so you don't know where the city begins and ends because they even, you know, the the, 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 the meaning of city is very volatile. You know? mm. But what I think I can say is that uh, to me, a city is the, uh, uh, the high the, the high frequency transit uh, framework. Mm. You know, you can drive uh, a hidden geometry of the high frequency transit framework of Milan, and that is the part of the privileged people, you know, about inclusiveness, where you can live without a car, that you have freedom to move by different modes. And then you have the outside, where the car becomes uh, often your always viable option. And uh, where transit, as we know, transit, uh, public transport, is not viable because the densities are not there. So mm. that's, I think, where the big challenge for the future of the city are actually, is actually happening. So that is, uh, in my opinion, the, 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 the challenge ahead of us. The very final thing is that, uh, uh, also to go back to Stefan's slide, uh, mm. governance and I would say political vision. And uh, Milan has two problems. One of the city boundaries uh, are very limited. So the entire uh, community of, uh, say, another three million people that are uh, kind of gravitating around the city are different uh, administrative boundaries. So. For Milan mm. itself, it's difficult to, to govern. And I think that uh, also in these times, in these critical times, is uh, and I really like uh, Anne Hidalgo uh, in that sense, in these critical times, or at least I like the narrative around Anne Hidalgo, maybe then uh, the truth is different, but mm. uh, I think it's time for uh, a strong political vision of transformation. Mm. It's not time for incremental process, it's not time for uh, discussions, it's time for uh, deploying uh, a radical vision. And uh, mm. in a way, the catastrophe of, of COVID uh, was like something that might have triggered and accelerated that. I think this is what I really think is important and what I really think will happen in Milan soon. Mm. You know, there been, uh, yet the leadership has been good in a... Uh, in, uh, I think very good. At least part of the administrative uh, council was very good in responding to the COVID uh, challenges. Now mm. I think we it's time to do and take on the cha the challenge of decarbonization of dealing with the northern part of Milan and uh, move away from the car. I think it's really time for for push for that. Mm. 
Fantastic. Well, you both um, made some extremely profound points, uh, really, really thought-provoking. Prathima, shall we order, uh, order, shall we ask for some audience questions? Yeah, but I'm afraid we're completely run out of time. We're, I think this is such a rich conversation. Well, that's why. And yeah. I, I think we have a couple of our questions remaining too. We probably need another session to discuss a uh, future of infrastructure. Mm. Um, and uh, we've to, I, I would love to, and I want to say thank you to the audience who's uh, been with us during this important conversation over the last hour. Please share your comments or thoughts with Federico or Stefan and let us know if you have any questions. We'll try to take it if we can. Um, in the meantime, my, uh, I mean, we'll wait for some questions, but my uh, question to you both is, uh, the you both mentioned how the life of infrastructure is almost multi-generational. Mm. Uh, you know, it lasts, sometimes it lasts a century. How do we ensure that it's self-sustaining economically? Um, and how do you build um, and design infrastructure to last? And are you thinking about this, these issues while you're planning some of these big infrastructure projects around the world? Stefan? Uh, maybe, oh, Federico, you have... Yeah, well, well, just a, a quick word, I'll pass it on. Uh, you know, one, one of the interesting things I, I think is that um, an increased uh, awareness of the fact that it's generational and that mm. things move so quickly. Um, there was a kind of weak point in the history of engineering where I think we weren't so focused on that. And I was really, I said earlier, you know, with the clear specifications and everything like that. And that now we're more and more getting into a world where design has to take into account this idea I love of um, anticipatory reconversion. So the idea, for example, that we are building new parking lots, uh, new parking structures, sorry, structural parking garages, uh, knowing very well that in 10 or 15, 20 years, they may be completely obsolete. So the actual specifications of these structures is now taking into account reconversion into the original building mm -hmm. specs. And I think that we are I think um, also beginning to think about infrastructure more in that way. And so there's anticipating the need to reconvert and to reuse. Um, I think that's one of the promising things that we need to stay open-minded and, and create structures that can have multiple lives and multiple uses and, and uh, differentiate from single Federico? Yeah, yeah, I think that is a very good question because uh, city changes in a way that uh, uh, we did not expect you know mm -hmm. we know that mobility is not just infrastructure is uh, social cultural psycho psycho attitudinal uh, issues mm -hmm. uh, it's about uh, it's about the connection between infrastructure and and demand it's about policies it's about pricing you know the most effective measure in milan has been the road congestion pricing you know that you are familiar with in london it basically removed in the space of one day and has been like that for now six years. So it wasn't just a one-off few months kind of thing. He removed 30% of the access to the city center. And that was not an infrastructure. You know, that was not really anything solid. It's just as kind of controlling things by cameras and enforcing uh, uh, fines. And I think that uh, in a world that is uh, increasingly difficult to predict, uh, large infrastructures, large infrastructure. I'm not. Uh, uh, no, I think that uh, the Grand Paris and Paris has an issue traditionally of the fact that it was all around the periphery and everything outside was left over and uh, detached. And I think this is a great project. He has large value capture. He has uh, generates identities. I'm not criticizing it. Absolutely. I'm just saying that uh, uh, if I was to give my sense of, 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 of feeling is that we have to go towards solutions that are uh, you know, flexible, light, uh, 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 changing. We have to move away from large new infrastructure into something that becomes more, uh, more manageable, more, uh, more adaptable to a future that uh, now is imp impossible to predict. Yeah, I think, yeah, those are very uh, important points. I think uh, 
repurposing uh, and having flexible infrastructure and being light and using the new dis digital technologies for example for uh, governance and sustainability i want to say that this was such a rich uh, conversation we are over uh, <laughs> our usual time of 1 hour for this so i want to thank both of you for spending this hour with us on this very important topic and uh, we will probably get you back again because i think there were a ton of questions that i and lucy had which we could not get through and we do uh, yeah. yeah this is really the topic of the hour so uh, thank you for uh, sharing your uh, thoughts and uh, inputs with all of us word one thing that we really came together on Feder i i totally adhere with what federico said that we've passed the time for incremental measures i think that yeah. if people can take away one thing from our discussion uh, that's something yeah. that i hope federico and i share very strongly great that's very profound i um, i i really also appreciate learning about the concept of anticipatory reconversion as part of future proofing you know a broad based future proofing strategy um and perhaps we should we could have retitled made the title the future of infrastructure in a world that is increasingly different difficult to predict um but uh, i think we need to make that the title of the next session and bring you back again and <laughs> now you know each other very well so <laughs> and i hope we all can probably meet again yeah, after exactly. this nightmare of a pandemic is over thank yeah. you both so much for yeah, joining thank you us so much. and it's a real pleasure and thank, thank you. you to thank our you. audience and uh, stay in touch and stay connected with us we'll come to you every week every tuesday evening at the same time um, bringing you discussion on the future of uh, cities Thank you so much. Thank you.